Well, welcome everybody. Thank you, Pam, for the greeting. And Pam did a great job putting this on. I've been here for about 14 and a half years at Family Service and Guidance Center doing a variety of things. Um, this is probably my favorite opportunity to do is get out in the community and train people, train schools, train parents, train staff, whatever it is. I love it. It's fun to me. We're going to have a good time. I apologize if I talk fast. This is going to be an eight hour training that we've condensed in about an hour and a half. So bear with me. If you have questions, blurt them out. Raise your hand. I'll call on you if I see you. If I don't see you, just blurt it out. It's perfectly fine. I expect to be interrupted, so don't worry about it. There's a lot of information to cover as we go along. So, good to go? All right. So thank you guys for all brave. And if we can get rolling, dancing. Thank you, ma'am. I know. It's weird. I can't. It's not right behind me. Go ahead. I know. So just in general, the first thing you want to look at is what anxiety really is. How many people in here have ever had anxiety? Right? Everybody's going to raise their hand. You know someone or suffered from it or had a child or a family member who has had anxiety over something. Whether it's a speech in front of class, whether it's something you did wrong, something you did right, whatever it is. We've had anxiety about something, spiders, snakes, whatever it is. We'll get to some crazy examples that I've experienced recently, not recently, but in my life that you guys can all laugh at and make fun of me for. Um, it can be lighthearted, but it can also be devastating. Um, we've, we've had kids have fears of wind chimes, which is a little off the chart. And we've had kids who had fears of cleanliness so much so they would take showers so hot that they would burn themselves with boiling water, that they would drink hand sanitizer to clean themselves out. Anxiety can be devastating. That's why we're here to talk about this. It can be from refusing to go to school to much more severe stuff that requires hospitalization, a lot more long-term type treatment. Uh, so anxiety in general is just a feeling of danger. There doesn't have to be danger present. It's just the worry that it's there. So if someone comes up to me and points a gun at my head, I'm not anxious, I'm terrified, I'm scared. That's not anxiety, you have a reason to be afraid, right? Anxiety is when someone, I don't like snakes. Snakes terrify me. If there's a snake back there, I'm okay with it. If there's a snake on this table, I'm pushing you guys out of my way to get out that door. I'm gonna fight you to crawl and get over you because to me, every snake is a black mamba and they're all gonna eat me and kill me. That's my anxiety. I'm well aware of that. It don't matter. I still don't like snakes, right? Big difference between anxiety and fear. Uh, fear is, there's a reason to be fearful. We have a reason to, to feel that way. Jancy. This is a cool comic, a little strip that one of our clients made for us in our anxiety program. I had the privilege of working with this, at the time, nine-year-old girl, who's what we call selectively mute. Selectively mute kids don't talk to people. She identified one person which was her safe person. That was her mother. She had never talked to her father. She had never talked to her grandparents. It's other than maybe slips here and there. Imagine trying to do therapy with someone in the situation. It's brutal. And so we start with basic things like trying to get them to move their mouth or blowing on a windmill or chewing gum in front of us. The first thing she shed in front of me was inappropriate. She threw the F-bomb at me. <laughs> but I celebrated. I'm sitting here like, yeah! Success! It was exciting. I was happy. And she was not happy. She was terrified. She breaks down in tears. And I'm just like, wow, this is really hard for you. Right? Realizing how difficult it was for her that moment was one thing. Afterward, she showed me, she actually was honored in an article in a Kansas City, Kansas City Center for Anxiety, a big anxiety treatment center around here, does a magazine. And she was actually featured in the article uh, with a quote she said that before she had treatment, she felt like she was just glass that was just going to be hit with a hammer every time she opened her mouth was just going to shatter. Imagine a nine-year-old feeling that way. This is why we do what we do. This is why it's so important to us. Because this went unidentified for a while. She thought she was just a quiet kid. It wasn't she was just a quiet kid. It was a lot deeper than that. I get emotional when I talk about it, but the first time she talked to her dad was the coolest moment ever. I got to witness that, and dad is just in tears, bawling. She's nine years old and hadn't talked to her dad ever. It was really cool. First thing she said to him was, I love you. How cool is that, right? Really cool stuff that we get to do. So she came to this. She was able to jump to the worst conclusions in a single bound. That's anxiety in a nutshell. How many of you have ever done that? Your loved one's late coming home from work, and it's snowing out, and your loved one's never late, and you're sitting there on the couch, and you're like, huh, it's 8.30. She's supposed to be home at 8 o'clock. And in your mind, you're going, she's fine. But somewhere in the back of your mind, anxiety starts tugging and says, she got a car wreck. It's stormy out. It's starting to snow. She's not alive. Or he's not alive. What, everybody's not in their head. Everybody's experienced this, right? Or a kid. I know I did that to my parents all the time. <laughs> we all probably did. I've done it with my wife before. 
She makes me nervous when she drives in the first place because she just doesn't like driving. She's from a real small town. She doesn't like to drive in busy areas. She was driving on a holiday out with her mom, doing shopping on Black Friday, and they were like an hour later than anticipated. She didn't answer her phone, and I, of course, panicking, knowing it's anxiety, trying to use the tool to teach you guys tonight to calm myself down. It didn't work. Anxiety is real. It affects us all, right? We jump to the worst conclusions very quickly, and our thoughts absolutely control us and get in the way of that. Ready for the next slide, Jansen. So, when does anxiety become anxiety? Just kind of what I was explaining there. Fears and concerns are unreasonable or out of proportion for what the situation is. Again, if someone's holding a gun to my head, is it reasonable that I'm afraid? Absolutely. If someone's breaking into my house, is it reasonable that I'm afraid? Absolutely. Now, if I'm worried about someone breaking into my house every single night so much so that I'm sleeping one or two hours because I have to get up every hour to check the alarm, to make sure the dog's awake to protect the house, to lock the doors, to lock the windows, to make sure the baseball bat's by my bed or whatever it is, that's when it becomes excessive. That's anxiety. Are some things reasonable to be afraid of, like maybe public speaking? Absolutely. But if it comes to the point where you have a child or yourself that can't do a public speech and you're failing because of it, that's when things become really complicated. Reassuring someone isn't enough. Have you ever been anxious and someone told you, ah, oh, it's okay? How helpful is that? <laughs> right? It's not. It just makes you worry more because in the back of your mind, all your brain is telling you is, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap. Things aren't going well. I'm nervous. I'm a wreck. It doesn't matter what you say. I know she's been late 15 times before, but this time is different and I can't tell you why. And that thing's not like screaming at us, telling us something different. Symptoms generalized to increasingly more situations, so my fear of snakes is considered anxiety, but it's not something that would really ever want to go treat. Because how often do I have a snake in my house? <laughs> Once, you'll hear that story later. Um, how often do I worry about, if my fear of snakes was so bad, and I work with kids like this, that they wouldn't go outside because they had a fear of snakes. That's when we jump in and want to treat it. A fear of snakes is a pretty normal fear. How many people here are afraid of snakes? Spiders? Wasp stinger things, things like that, right? A lot of people are raising their hands with this. I don't like them either. Spiders don't bother me too much. Snakes, I'm terrified of. And like I said, I will beat you all at the door if one shows up. Um, usually when I do that, people start backing away. I start asking if they're afraid of snakes. People are like backing away and moving their chairs back. I'm like, dude, I'm not holding a snake. There's no way I'm bringing that in as an example. So um, you start seeing an interfering growth of productivity and sleep problems. So I'm going to go ahead and throw my example out here to show you what anxiety was like for me. And this was really eye-opening for me in the sense of trying to understand how my clients feel and how the parents feel sometimes in those situations. So as I've disclosed multiple times already, I don't like snakes. Well, there is a snake in my house. I live in an older neighborhood in Topeka, and we have a coal chute in our house and the snake crawled into the coal chute. So I saw it one night, it crawled out of the water heater, and I scream bloody murder. We have a newborn baby, my wife comes down with the baby, and she goes, what's wrong? As I'm literally strapping catcher's gear on. I'm putting shit yarns, I'm putting chest plate, I'm putting a helmet on, I have a rake and a hoe, and I'm ready to go to battle with this thing. Because in my mind was not garter snake. In my mind was black mama, right? I know black mamas don't live here. I didn't care it was going to kill me or it was going to eat me. Any snake is going to kill me if you want to see my house. That's all that mattered, right? <clears throat> my lovely wife says, here, take Jim up. So I take my daughter. She grabs the snake, walks outside. <laughs> She's my hero. <laughs> my wife is five foot two, country girl. She is tiny, but she saved my life that night, and I owe her everything to this day, right? Well, the snake found its way back in. About a week later, I'm doing laundry. I'm at home by myself with the baby this time. Baby's crying, wanting milk. I'm on the phone with my wife, like panicking. There's a snake. It's back behind the dryer. The baby was away. How far away? She, I just got to the grocery store. I'm like, you need to come back and feed the baby. She's like, you go feed the baby. And I was like, I can't. I've got to keep an eye on the snake. It's going to run away. And she goes, oh, it'll probably just go back under the water heater. So of course, I go get the baby. And I come back, like sprinting down the stairs with my infant. And the snake's gone. Do you have any idea how terrifying it is when you know it's in your house, but you have no idea what a daggum thing is? Oh man, don't go on Google. Where do snakes hide? Guess, any guesses? 
everywhere. They climb stairs, they climb walls, anywhere warm, your bed, your sheets, under your pillows, under your mattresses, under your cushions, under your couch. Oh my gosh, it was so awful. I couldn't sleep that, but I literally did not sleep that first night. Um, every time my wife would like put her arm around me, she got hit. <laughs> we have a cat in the house. The cat's tail looks suspiciously and feels suspiciously like a slimy, dirty snake that's going to eat you in the, in the middle of the night. So the cat got thrown out for the night. It wasn't an outdoor cat, but it became an outdoor cat real fast. <clears throat> I came to work the next day and I was utterly exhausted. And I didn't want to come back home. I was like, huh, that thing is still there. I called my wife like five times, you find it yet? And she's like, I'm not going to find a snake in it. It's going to crawl back out. And I said, that's fine, you can crawl back out. So my wife made the decision to, she found the hole and she sealed it. And I said, brilliant, now it's trapped in the house, <laughs> right? And that's the only thing that's stuck in my mind. For weeks go on, I am hanging my clothes up on shoes line, on, on fishing line, in my bedroom, because I know the snake can't climb on that fishing line, right? My shoes and everything were up on this. My wife was, thought it was hilarious. Um, she played many, many pranks during this time. Oh, love you, honey. So uh, she, she had a good time with it. I was literally contemplating moving with my parents. I was not sleeping. Working was hard. It was affecting my productivity at work. It was affecting my attitude at work. It was affecting my attitude at home. Work was my respite. It was nice to get away from home, away from this dangerous creature that was going to eat my face off, to come to work and not have to worry about a snake being here. So I come home one night, about a month later, my symptoms start to kind of subside. Over time, anxiety will go away. I kind of figured it probably left the house, so I'm good, right? Well, I'm downstairs, of course, doing laundry. I bring the laundry upstairs, and I put my hand in my pants, and I pull it out, and something wraps around my arm. The scream that came, the primal roar that came out of my mouth was so loud, I think the neighbors woke up. Our neighbors are gun-toting people. They are NRA supporters beyond belief. They literally run outside in the rain to check to see if everything's okay. I'm the idiot outside my boxers, throwing the entire bag of laundry out there and taking a broom and just beating the clothes. And they said, Travis, what are you doing? I said, there's a snake in my pants! Not something you ever want to say again in front of your neighbors out loud. Really a weird conversation for the future. They haven't let me go. They also ran after that. These are big bodybuilder guys. Like, literally, that's what they do for a living. They took off running back to their house. I'm like, you guys have the guns. This thing is going to kill us all. Right? It obviously wasn't going to kill me. It died. Um, we ceremoniously burned them and my pants in the backyard. Um, and it was over. But just the example of that. Has anybody had an example like that? Not have to share it, but we've had that experience, right? Terrifying. It's awful. It feels horrible. Horrible. Well, I can laugh about it today. In that moment, it was so uncomfortable. It was so miserable. There was nothing funny about it. There was nothing enjoyable about it. Every day, going through this, checking under the pillows, hitting my wife when she put her arm around me, not sleeping with blankets and freezing because they didn't want to be warm because the snake likes warm places. Right? <coughs> it wasn't comfortable. It was an awful feeling. Uh, luckily, I haven't had a snake in my house since then. If I get one, it'll be another story for you all. So I keep dancing, can't see me. <clears throat> so lots of different anxiety disorders. If I touch base on something here you're more interested about, just raise your hand and ask. Um, I've been over these many times, but we're just going to touch base on them real quickly. Um, generalized anxiety disorder. This is probably the most difficult to treat. Not probably, it absolutely is, to be honest. What generalized anxiety disorder? This is someone who, what we kind of coin as living a life of anxiety. There's someone who's afraid of anything and everything at any given time. We're not talking just snakes, we're talking everything. We're talking about the roof caving in, we're talking about the coronavirus, we're talking about whatever it is, mom not coming home, we're talking about being late to school, we're talking about people making fun of us. All of these things combined become generally anxiety disorder. This is really difficult to treat in the sense of the way we manage it is we teach them how to manage their anxiety as a lifestyle. Because it does, something doesn't go away when you have this type of lifestyle. It's really challenging, it's really difficult. Not that it's not treatable, but it's by far the most difficult anxiety disorder to treat that we have. Everything else on this, on this list, we have about a 16 week process, and we're usually done with treatment. We've had some kids come in, and we've had so much success with our anxiety treatment program. We do sessions like this, just an introductory section. We teach them about anxiety, and they go, that makes sense, and they don't come back. They come back maybe six weeks just to check up, and we're done. Lots of different brain levels of anxiety. Again, we look at my three snakes to the girl who was taking showers and, and, and 
essentially blowing her skin and drinking hand sanitizer to cleanse herself because she thought she was dirty. So when you say 16 weeks, you mean like 16 sessions kind of thing? Or like, how is that? So that's a tricky question. It depends on how long. 16 sessions is what I mean. Um, typically, you try and see our anxiety clients weekly. It just kind of depends on the case load at the time. So it could be 32 weeks if you're doing every other week. Um, and then we, we typically do 16 weeks, and then we'll do follow-ups like every six weeks. It's not uncommon for a client to finish the treatment and then come back for what we call a follow-up session. So we kind of hang on to these cases. We don't close them, per se. So we don't have to go through all the admission paperwork again. We'll keep them open for about six months, typically. And toward the end of that time, a clinician will call and say, hey, How's so-and-so doing? Just checking in on you guys, making sure things are okay. You know what? We've had some issues. Why don't you come back in and we'll address it right now and not get out of the floor? And it's so much easier that way instead of just closing it out and waiting a year later and then we're starting from ground zero again. So those, those refresher appointments are really important. What we do is we teach you guys how to do our job. We want you guys to learn how to do this stuff and how to do it yourselves as parents or as the anxious person or as children. Whatever it is, we try and teach you guys how to do what we do. <coughs> Specific phobias, just like, I was, like, just like I was saying, I've seen wind chills, spiders, snakes, public speaking, all kinds of fun to stuff with specific phobias. Um, you can have anything and everything. Tornadoes are a pretty common one this time of year. We get a lot of kids coming with storm phobias. Um, social anxiety, just what it sounds. The fear of other people, essentially. A lot of times what social anxiety is, is a fear of being made fun of. It's a fear of other people judging you. Uh, we've all been there at some point, probably. Uh, what I like to tell kids I work with is when they are up there on the stage doing their speech in speech class as a freshman or sophomore in high school, they're terrified because everybody's looking at them. I sit back and I think, man, I remember being in high school and no one was looking at me. Everybody was on their phone. I have a phone at the time, sorry. But now everybody's on their phone playing Fortnite. No one's paying attention to you except for maybe one or two people and the teacher, right? That's the anxiety that tells you everybody in the world is looking at you, right? In that, in that situation, there are really usually not that many people doing it, not many people focusing on you at the time. So, um, separation anxiety, this one's really tricky. We've seen the separation anxiety from really young kids, typically, but I've seen up to 15 and 16 year olds, too. Um, usually in younger kids, um, you'll, you'll see it in the schools. A really good sign of this is that kid who will not let you go when you're trying to drop them off at school. Has anybody experienced that? Any teachers here? Yeah? What, what ages do you guys teach? <coughs> We've probably seen some of that, then. Yeah, you've definitely seen it then, right? We get kind of calls about that kind of stuff from schools all the time to help train teachers, to help train elementary teachers, preschool teachers, because it's difficult for kids to make that transition in the first place. But a kid who has anxiety, it's even more difficult because they're already more prone to having that issue, having that separation piece. Again, that's the person they love. That's the person they know everything about that's taken care of them for the whole life so far, and it's hard to get away. If not treated early, we run into 16-year-olds who haven't been to school for a couple years. And I've had that in my office too. Um, that gets really tricky because courts get involved with truancy, because schools get involved with failing kids, right? It doesn't matter, this was a really athletic kid. Great athlete, had a couple instances in school where he just was down, he couldn't make it back anymore. The first time I took this poor kid back to school, I am like trying to grab on his coattails and say, don't go into school, this is too much for you right now. And he's like, oh, I got this. He marched into school and the bell rings. Hundreds of students come out and they all recognize him. Hey, how are you? Give him a pat on the back. He gets sick, like, literally got, got sick. He ran to the bathroom, did his thing, came back out, and he goes, I'm never seeing you again. And I said, well, hold on. I said, because I, I, I tried to warn you about this, right? I tried to say, well, it's not, you're not ready for this. Well, he was in a rush because he didn't want to go to jail. I mean, that's a reality for some of our youth, because their anxiety can get so bad with school refusal that truancy is an issue, and the courts don't play with it very well. So we have to work in a rapid pace. This kid was seen three times a week by me, by other interns, by our anxiety treatment program director at the time. It was a lot of people seeing this young man, and, and we, we, he was successful. He transitioned him back, he did great, he's graduated high school now. Again, we would really have to, and we would have to hit that ball, and we have to hit it running fast because courts are involved or something like that. We're gonna do everything we can to throw people at this child to make it work. He had to see a lot of different people. It wasn't typical, just one person. He saw about four different therapists over that time. Uh, but he got to know all of us really well and trust us all really well. He did an excellent job. He had a little extra motivation to get there. But part of his struggle was his mom was very ill and his grandpa was very ill. His dad recently passed away. Um, grandpa had terminal cancer, mom had terminal cancer, and he was afraid that if he left, mom was gonna die. There's some real fear in that, but there's a lot of anxiety too because mom was given like 10 years to live. Right, and it was only eight years. 
So some anxiety, some fear, it, it, it can get mixed and confused at times too. Panic attacks are a lot different than what people realize. A lot of people will come to me and say, Travis, my child's having a panic attack. A panic attack isn't just a lot of anxiety all of a sudden. A panic attack is actually defined by being afraid of the symptoms of anxiety. So some symptoms of anxiety. What do you guys feel when you get anxious? Sick. Sick, Sick to your stomach? Mm -hmm. Racing heart? Sweaty hands? Okay. Right? Can't think straight? Our thoughts are all over the place? Right? So when your heart starts racing, you might think you're having a heart attack. We get a lot of phone calls from hospitals saying, hey, can you guys come check this out? We think it's a panic attack. Can we refer somebody to you? We get that from doctors all the time because that's really what a panic attack is. Neither here nor there, even if you're having extreme anxiety, it's not quote unquote a clinical panic attack. You should still see someone about it because it's still worth it. If it's keeping you in from leaving or doing things or, or being yourself and doing what you want to do, get some treatment. We'll, we'll talk about adult access for treatment too if that's something you guys are interested in as well since we do mostly with the kids. Uh, we do treat adults kind of vicariously to the kids, if that makes sense. Um, it, it's not really, we, 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 we're, we're not licensed to do it with the adults at this time. It's something we'd love to do, but it's just not there for us yet. Uh, but we do kind of do it vicariously to the kids by treating them with these same kind of premises and how to manage your anxiety. And the kids, it's really fun sometimes when the kids really grasp it before the parents. And the kids are like, oh, mom, but guess what? Let's just restructure this thought. Let's just restructure that thought. Mom, guess what? It's going to be okay. And walking through it with the parent is really cool to watch that process too. Selective like mutism I talked about briefly. That was a little girl who wouldn't talk to anybody. Um, obsessive compulsive disorder. Anybody ever know anybody with OCD? Yeah, several people. It's a lot more common than we realize. I had my first anxiety client was a disaster um, in, in when it started. Um, I was do I was an intern here under Dr. Callis, and she and I are in the room doing a session with a young man who did everything in threes. Light switch on and off three times. To click the glass against his lip three times. Rush your seat three seconds here, three seconds here, three seconds here, and just repeat three times. Everything. Touch the third step. Touch the third doorknob. Whatever it was, you had to touch the third of everything or do everything three times. Jump three times. Sit three times. It was wild. So I was sitting here like, okay, this is going to be interesting. So I know how to treat this. Fresh out of college. Let's do this. So we start doing it. We jump into it. His fear was if he didn't do it, mom's getting in a car wreck and die. So we start running through some basic things like, how, how many times did mom been in a car wreck in her 40 years of life? And mom said it once. Right? We start thinking logically. We start teaching people to think in a more logical way because his fear is if he doesn't do this, mom's going to get in a car wreck and die. What are the odds of that happening? Let me tell you a lot better than I thought. Mom didn't get in a car wreck and die. Mom got in a car wreck literally right out front of the building as I'm walking him out of session. And he just did his first what we call exposure, which meant he did something four times instead of three. I tried to make him do it twice, and the clever little mature jumped twice. And he sits down in his chair, and he does this. <laughs> I go, well played. <laughs> well played, gotta do it one more time now. He goes, no, I will not do that again. And I said, yeah, yeah you will, and I'm gonna prove to you your mom's not gonna get a car wreck. <laughs> I was wrong, mom got a car wreck out front. Of course, the other person in the car wreck was very upset, so police were involved, ambulance was involved, fire was involved. It was a circus, it was a show, and this kid is just glaring at me like he is gonna rip my head off. And I'm thinking like, oh my, I look at Abby, my, my intern sister right at the time, and I go, do I do? And she goes, <laughs> luckily, the kid came back. He was very angry for several weeks because he had evidence now that if he didn't do it three times, his mom was going to get hurt, right? Our little piece that we had to say was that mom didn't get sick and die. Mom didn't get the car and die, because that was his real fear. And that was enough. This young man ended up graduating, doing just fine. He had all kinds of other anxiety we had to work with, but we got the OCD taken care of, and things just kind of snowballed from there. A lot of times you'll see kids with just a list of anxiety diagnoses, two or three, that's not really quite that generalized anxiety diagnosis and we'll start with whatever's most pressing sometimes. Sometimes kids want to start with whatever's the easiest. And that's okay, because we give them that little bit of success with it. They're like, this works. This really does work. This is really hard work for people going through it. If you've ever done anxiety treatment, it is incredibly challenging to do, because what we do is we make you anxious, right? We've all seen it on Dr. Phil, we've all seen it on the talk shows, that exposure therapy, that, that flooding type therapy. We don't do flooding, we do exposure therapy, and we expose you to what you're afraid of. For a kid who's selectively mute, we're going to walk him around the building and have him shake hands with people. 
Or maybe we'll start with just saying hi, right? Instead of shaking hands. I've had kids do crazy things. One of my favorites, I had a young girl who became quite the class clown, um, so much so that we had to kind of bring that in too. But she was going around shaking people's hands. She, she would just panic, just waving at people's offices at first. Then we do fun things like name my stuffed animal. And we have votes on naming the stuffed animal or something like that. Just make it fun for her. Um, and then one day she went up to, of all people, our CEO, and goes up to her and says, hi, my name's Travis. I wipe with that hand and walks off. And I was like, that is brilliant, right? Because the goal was to embarrass herself. And it didn't embarrass her at all. She was at the point where she didn't care what people thought about her anymore, right? And she was like, I've got this. And she looked at me with the biggest smile on her face. And Brenda, our CEO, looks at me like, what just happened? And I said, ATP, which is anxiety treatment program. And she just smiled. She goes, whatever works, right? And we moved on. Uh, it was a great day. So Tretz and Tick, um, if, if that's what you have questions about, I can answer some. This is one of the things on anxiety that I don't treat, um, just because I don't know as much about it as some of our other providers. We have people who specialize in it specifically. So it's not my thing, but if you're interested, I can still answer questions for you about it. If you, if you have questions, feel free to ask now or afterward. Um, I can talk about treatment for that as well. School refusal is what we've talked about as well. A lot of times that social anxiety um, is not technically a diagnosis, but we see it a lot. We kind of wish it was a diagnosis because we see a lot of kids that you're using to go to school for a variety of reasons. So if you had to say where anxiety started, we have a triangle here. Thoughts, feelings, or behaviors, where would you say the anxiety starts? You guys have to talk for a second so I can drink. Yeah. Oh, sure. So that, that, that line of being like clinical anxiety between social anxiety and being shy really becomes, is it, disability, is, is it a disability to the kid? Are, are they unable to do daily activities because of it? Are they unable to function well in school? Are they unable to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? I would say a shy kid probably has some anxiety and it's probably worth getting checked out. Um, it, it's better safe than sorry because even if it is just a shy kid, that's really easy, it's really quick to, to address that. It probably is anxiety more than likely. Um, if, if the, the wallflower type of kid or the kid who's just quiet in general, you don't know because that really quiet kid could be that selective immune kid who was that way for eight years who felt like a shard of glass and if she got hit, she was gonna shatter, right? That's not a good feeling. We don't want our children to feel that way. We don't want to feel that way. So I always suggest if you're concerned about it, bring them in. Um, ask for some work, ask for some help, and we can get you the right resources in the right direction if that's the direction to go. Um, it, it's, it's really hard to tell without getting your eyes on it and, and knowing more information, uh, but just saying, is, is it a shy kid? My guess is there's anxiety there, right? Uh, so. Um, so I heard feelings, I heard thoughts. Where it really starts is your thoughts. Um, if you really think about it, going back to the example that we've all experienced with a loved one or a child being late home, right? My wife's home 30 minutes late, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, where is she? And that first thought comes into my head and it starts to spiral, right? I wonder if she got in a wreck. And I start pacing. And I start making phone calls. And I start looking, I just find, with, now it's 35 minutes late. Now it's 40 minutes, now it's 41 minutes late. Now it's 41 minutes and 30 seconds late. And we start to panic a little bit, right? The thoughts start to spiral out of control from she just got in her fender bender to she got in a wreck to she got in a wreck and rolled over and the car's on fire to oh my gosh, she got flung out of the car seat. Even though I know she always wears her seatbelt, she got flung out of the car, a semi hit her, she ran her over and she's lying dead on the side of the road. You ever been there? Situations last year. <laughs> People nodding their heads. Yeah, absolutely. I've been there, we've all been there. It's what we do to ourselves with anxiety. So we start, our focus is to stop that thought process. If we can stop that spiraling of the thought, we can get things back in touch. You heard me talking about this so already with kind of the restructuring thoughts, what we call it, cognitive restructuring. Um, it's the premise of the therapy treatment we do. Um, it's, it's changing the thoughts, I think, more rationally. So if I have a kid who's afraid of tornadoes, this time of year it's common, right? We get meteorologists involved, we'll get science involved, and we'll use numbers because math doesn't lie very often, right? So we'll talk about how many tornadoes does Topeka have in a year on average? by tornado warnings, right? How many touch ground? On average, one, right? On average, what's the size of that tornado? It's like an F1. Again, we're talking averages, 
can that big one happen? Do we still need to be prepared? Absolutely, we don't need to be prepared. We want kids to be somewhat anxious about it. Anxiety isn't always a bad thing. If you're completely not anxious and you're chasing the tornado and all of a sudden hit your car, you got a problem. It's good to be safe, it's good to be prepared. But kids who get, see that dark cloud in the sky and they think, oh my gosh, there's gonna be a tornado today. Right? They don't know the difference between a tornado watch or tornado warning, or severe thunderstorm watch, or severe thunderstorm warning. All of us the same, and it means there's a black lava, they're gonna die. Right? So it gets really interesting to work with kids like that. So we'll use numbers, we'll throw numbers at them. Again, we'll look at the size of a tornado. How, how big is a tornado typically? What's the biggest tornado you've heard of? Think of more, think of places like that, Greensboro. We're talking two mile wide tornadoes. How wide is Topeka? What are the odds of it actually hitting your house? They're so small, so infinitesimal, that you start to realize, oh, yeah, should I be afraid? Sure. That's OK. I'm not going to tell you, you shouldn't be afraid of tornadoes. Should you be so afraid that when you see a dark cloud in the sky, you don't go outside and you're panicking and you're hiding in your basement all night? Probably not. Probably a little excessive, right? So we'll do things like that. Um, we will wait until we have a tornado drill the agency. We'll, we'll plan a tornado drill after hours sometimes. Or a fire drill, those fires are worried about. Or we'll pull the fire alarm and tell them, it's a tornado alarm. That's our agency tornado drill. When you go to the basement, we need to take shelter. And we prep the parents, but we don't prep the kid. We'll tell the kid afterward, right? But we want them to feel that anxiety so we can work with them in that process, why they're anxious, so we can talk through them in that, in that moment, right? Uh, it's really tough to do it when you're just sitting in the office. That's why we do exposure. We want them to have it as real as it can be. Some things are harder to expose than others, like tornadoes, because we can't plan them. Well, we can do our best to plan them by pulling the fire alarm or by saying, hey, there's a tornado drill, or have reception say, there's a tornado warning for this area. Well, the whole agency knows what's going on, and not making we're going to participate because we usually do it at 6, 7 o'clock, well, after hours. We still do it. And it works really, really well to get that kid's thoughts back on track that, hey, there's a tornado warning. Did you die? Right? How many times has there been tornado warnings when you've been alive? You're 40 years old and your mom is. How many times has she been in a tornado? How many times has I hit her house? How many times has she seen one? Zero, zero, zero. Makes sense? So how anxiety works. Some of us are just more predisposed to anxiety. It's just the way we were made. It's just the way we were designed. It's just who we are. Have you ever met that person who's just generally anxious? Right? For me, if there's a snake back there, I'm keeping an eye. If the snake crawls up here, I'm backing away. If the snake comes any closer, that is my anxiety, hitting what we call a 10, which is kind of that max level. I'm panicking. I'm focusing no reasoning in my brain up here in the front of my brain. It's all fight or flight. It's all the back of my brain. I'm focused on getting the heck out of Dodge because I'm going to die because the black mamba, garter snake, is going to kill me. Um, it, it, it's really challenging because people can have different responses. Um, I've, I've had kids be afraid of going outside because of snakes, like I said. I've had kids be afraid of public speaking, but sometimes it's just in front of girls. Sometimes it's just in front of guys. Sometimes it's just in front of adults. Sometimes it's just in front of... We ask a hundred questions to get to the gist of it, to develop what we'll call a hierarchy. We'll get to that in a bit, too, to talk about what it is. But what happens? Has anybody ever died from anxiety? No. Eventually what happens, your body starts to recover, your body starts to respond. For most people, it's about 10 minutes. Uh, after about 10 minutes, if we can hold you at that level where you're anxious for about 10 minutes, your body's just going to naturally start to calm down on its own. Right? What a lot of people try to do is, I know I've got that speech coming up. Mom, I've got the flu. Right? And then you met that makeup day, you get the flu again. That makeup day, you get the flu again and you avoid the anxiety. So you're getting anxious because that day's coming, and you're getting up there to an eight and a nine, and the day's here, and you say, you know what, Mom, no, I'm sick. I've got a 102 temperature, I can't go to school. What's your anxiety to do then? Well, it's right, success, it's over. Until the teacher calls and says, you gotta do it next week. Right? Avoidance doesn't work. Avoidance perpetuates anxiety and continues anxiety. So if you find yourself anxious to something, you find your youth anxious to something, your child, your loved one, whoever it is, the best thing you can do is not avoid it. Now if it's so bad that avoidance is the only way they can really function at that moment, please come in. That, that's serious levels of anxiety that we really need to do something about, right? 
That's absolutely something that needs to be addressed by professionals. It's absolutely something that needs to be, even if it's not that bad, come in. We, we can treat it quickly. We can teach you so much about it so fast. And it really is fun. Most kids love the program. They come in and they enjoy it. This time of year, it gets to be summertime. We have people come from out of county. We've had people come from out of state for our anxiety program because it's successful. We're the only child anxiety program in the state right now. One of the few in the country right now for children and it's a really successful program. They do such a good job. It's about a 75% success rate. Um, those who don't succeed are ones who either drop out or they don't do the homework assignments they're given. And homework is essential in this because the homework keeps you from avoiding, right? You have a hand washer. What's the hand washer afraid of? Viruses, diseases, etc. But this time of year right now, the hand washer is washing hands every two seconds. Most of us are, right? There's a lot of fun stuff going around that no one wants to catch. Um, so when you have that kid in your office, that is so hard. Or as a parent, that's so hard because the kid just wants to wash and wash and wash. How do you monitor that, right? I can stop you from washing your hands for an hour in therapy, but if you go wash your hands right afterward, it undoes everything we just did, and we're back to square one. That's really hard. It takes a lot of work from the parents involved and things like that as well. Um, but what happens when we avoid is we teach ourselves that there's a reason to be afraid. If we avoid doing the speech, we don't ever learn there's nothing to not to fear about the speech. Right? If the kid wouldn't have stopped doing things every three times and had OCD, he wouldn't have ever learned that he didn't have to do that to protect his mom. Right? Even though we had a crazy coincidence, he came, overcame it because they would have realized that was the next step. Go to the next slide, if you would, please. <clears throat> so this is kind of what I was talking about, that 10-minute limit. Um, if it lasts more than 10 minutes, you really do have an issue. Um, it really is a lot more severe anxiety. If it's lasting night, probably getting in that panic attack range. Um, you uh, are really, really struggling if it's lasting more than 10 minutes. But most people, your body will start to just shut down on its own in about 10 minutes. Because when you're anxious, what's it feel like? You are so overwhelmed. And if you've ever been anxious for 10 minutes to a level to where we're talking like a 10, you're exhausted afterwards, right? Some of the kids we work with are constantly living. That shy kid could be that one who is constantly anxious and just can't verbalize, just can't tell anybody what it is. So it's really important to look into it, investigate, and ask questions and see what it is that makes them, if they're nervous, if they're anxious, use those words. Um, I had a kid who identified anxiety as Mr. Freaks. I love that name. I thought it was the most clever name. He would always talk to Mr. Freaks and talk about Mr. Freaks being this thing that he had to get out of his head, and that was what anxiety was to him. It made it real for him, made it tangible to him, and it worked. Um, typically not my style, but it worked for him as we went with it. Eventually, what we teach through exposures is that if we sit in that problem for long enough, the anxiety starts to go away. If I go shake 10 people's hands, and people were friendly with me and not saying anything, it starts to feel pretty good, right? It starts to feel a little bit better. Okay, so now I'm not a 10, now I'm like a 5. Cool, that's a successful day. Um, Jancy, next slide, please. You can see that one. So what we do over, over time, what happens to do with this seems pretty simple. We'll just, just start to get easier every time. So we start at a 10, then we go to an 8, then we're at a 6, then we're at a 4, then we're at a 2, and then pretty soon, you have a little girl shaking hands with our CEO saying, I wipe with that hand. No one shakes hands and says that. No, but we take it to the nth degree, right? For a reason, because we want to make sure they can do it. We want to put it in situations that are so unusual that we want to know if they can handle it. Do they need to handle those types of situations? No, you're not going to go around walking and shaking people's hands. She did because she thought it was hilarious. Um, I kind of thought it was funny too until the school called. And I was like, oh, well, let's talk about social appropriateness now. So that's, that's my fault. Um, I like to have fun when I do it. I like the kids to have a good time. So I'll be goofy when I do it too. I've had kids go lay on people's office floors and just like a log, just plank there for, until someone notices them. Just lay there on the floor and make weird noises until someone says something. And sometimes I'll make them go in our office and I'll say, we're coming in, don't say anything for 10 minutes. Why 10 minutes? Because that's that limit too, right? Makes sense. And they have timid, sometimes we'll have people act like they're mad. What are you doing? Get out of my office! And eventually the kid's just like, that was kind of fun, right? Get that little shittiness back. Can I ask you a question? You may cover this, I apologize. Sure. But like, how would you do, 
exposure or response training or this type of, how would you handle that with like a PTSD anxiety? Absolutely. So that is really challenging. It depends on what the PTSD is, right? Um, do you have an example? Well, my son, he had cancer as a two-year-old, and now he has like this overwhelming fear of getting sick. Mm -hmm. um, and so he's always terrified that his cancer will come back or that he'll get sick. And um, so, like, I don't, I don't understand how exposure, like, how would you expose him to something? Right. And so, different kinds of PTSD, you can do exposure. Sometimes you can't. And this one, you could do some exposure stuff. A lot of education is what's going to take on this. It's going to take a lot of education. It's going to take professionals. I'm sure you've had doctors talk to him, explain stuff to him. Um, but it's going to take time. And PTSD is a bit of a different piece, which is why I didn't list it on the list of anxiety disorders. Is it an anxiety disorder? Absolutely. Um, for someone who has had PTSD from 9-11 or something like that, like that's very exposure-based. We can do a lot of exposure-based treatments on that. Someone from PTSD who's been a war veteran, we can do a lot of exposures and things like that. But what you're explaining is, is a lot more complicated anxiety. And can we do exposures? I have to really sit down and, and sit with you more and talk about it. Um, but I, I, I've got a couple ideas in my head that, we, that could work in that way, just constantly worrying about being sick. Like, right now, it's a perfect opportunity for exposures. Right? But, well, we don't want anybody to catch this illness going around. Right? I'm not going to say, here, go lick the table. But we can do things like that. It's got kind of an OCD vibe to it, it sounds like. Kind of like, a, you know, worried about getting sick, or when he gets sick, probably panics a little bit, et cetera. Um, it's okay, how many times have you been sick before? <coughs> Just walk through that. How many times have you been sick, Mom? Dad, how many times have you been sick? Aunt, how many brothers, sisters, how many times have you been sick? Right? How many times has it been cancer? It's a really hard conversation, especially when you're a two-year-old, because that's not just anxiety, it's trauma. Um, trauma, anxiety. He's eight now, so, so he's getting to an age where he understands enough that it's becoming more difficult. But he doesn't understand it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. So. And, and if he's not in services, I would encourage him. Um, because PTSD can be treated in many different ways. And this, is, this is more complex than just that. This is an emotional piece. Because there's a lot that goes to it. They, you know, there, there's probably some more hiding than just anxiety there. It sounds like there's definitely anxiety. My guess is probably a little bit more to it, if that makes sense. So, hope that helps answer your question yeah. somewhat. Yeah. So. so the master plan for dealing with anxiety. First things first, we want to empathize with what the person's feeling. Don't just blow it off and say, you shouldn't be anxious if there's a snake in the house. No, you should be anxious there's a snake in the house because it's the black mamba and it's going to eat you and you're going to die. No. Yes. <laughs> uh, no. Um, is that an irrational thought? Step three, absolutely it's an irrational thought. We label the problem as a worried brain. With younger kids, we'll talk about it as like a worried brain. It's not reality. Maybe that's a good example for an eight-year-old. Is saying, look, is it just your brain taking control? This is just your brain telling you, you need to be worried, you need to be afraid, you need to be... And what we do in this situation, too, we'll talk about that a little bit more. I just, my brain started working a little bit better here. Um, in the sense of how we can restructure thoughts that are coming. Oh my goodness, I'm sick, is it cancer, right? We can start restructuring those thoughts by talking about irrational thoughts. I have a little cheat sheet we'll use later. We'll use an example of someone brave enough to, to share an anxiety experience, or we might not do that, we might just, depending on time, we might just do a quick one. Uh, but irrational thoughts get in the way, and that's where it starts. That irrational thought of there being a snake in my house wasn't that there's just a snake in my house, it's that it was going to bite me, right? I knew it wasn't a black mamba, I knew it wasn't poisonous, but it was a snake, and it was ugly, and it was looking at me. And that's all the that matter, right? That's all the that matter. It was going to bite me, it was going to sleep with me, it was going to snuggle with me at night. I don't care if it wanted to be my pet. If I got my hands on it, it wasn't going to be alive much longer. Right? I, I don't do snakes. I, I, I had a point last year, I was mowing my lawn, <clears throat> and we had this little dog run. We don't have dogs, but the house before we got it had a dog run in there. And I was like, oh, kind of forgot to mow that part for the last couple of weeks. So the grass is super tall. I start mowing this black snake sitting in there, and I drop the mower and I run. And just goes, my wife, snake. And I said, yep. And she goes, I'll finish. I love you. <laughs> Uh, she is my hero, not just because of snakes, but it's a big part of it, I'll be honest. <laughs> and getting the body on board, um, this is where things get kind of tricky. Uh, different providers will tell you different things. Medications become really interesting with anxiety. Um, you want medications that can be helpful? A lot of providers will tell you don't use medications. Um, it depends on kind of what the treatment is. It depends on whether you need that crutch or not. 
The challenge with medications is if you over-medicate it, you can't feel the exposure, and then you rely on that medication forever. My personal preference is to avoid the medications, if at all possible. There's been times when I've recommended medication for severe OCD, for the girl I was telling you about who had to clean her body by drinking hand sanitizer, or taking so hot showers she would boil water and pour on herself to clean herself. That's obviously a situation where you want some more medications involved. I'm not saying anxiety medications are bad. Don't take it that way. But if you really do want to take it seriously and get over it, anxiety medications can help. If you can do it without anxiety medications, it's going to be faster. Not that it has to be super fast. You can take a year doing it, right? It's like a weight loss program. If you're trying to lose 100 pounds, don't do it in a week. If you're trying to get over anxiety, you don't have to do it in 16 weeks just because that's the average. Some kids take longer, and that's OK. Some kids take two weeks. It doesn't matter if it takes three years. It matters that we're making progress. That's the key. When we go at your own pace, that's one thing you'll see from our clinicians all the time. So we're going to refocus on what you want to do. What would you do if you were in charge and not the worry? I would sleep. If I knew that the worry wasn't in charge and there wasn't a snake in my house, I would, I would be sleeping. Right? That was awful. Oh, I don't like thinking about it. Stop making me talk about it. Reinforce the individual's efforts in fighting the worry. Do a good job. Right? It's really hard. What was one of the most helpful things for me was the snake experience. I've been anxious. I have never been afraid to do public speaking. I have never been afraid to be on a stage. I have never been afraid to, I'm just a social person. It's just who I am. This, this is fun. This, this doesn't bother me at all. Um, I know for some people this is terrifying. I could ask someone to come up here and I guarantee you I can find at least one person here who would just absolutely refuse to come up here for everybody and say something. I see some people shaking their heads. I'm not going to do it. Don't worry. Right? I know some people go up here, this guy right here, he's like, oh, you're right. call me a clown, let's go. <laughs> let's, let's, let's do this right now. Um, don't avoid facing it or reinforce escape or avoidance. The worst thing you can do for anxiety is avoid. If you're avoiding the anxiety, you're going to make things worse. Um, again, that's how anxiety perpetuates itself. That's how it continues. That's how it gets worse and worse and worse. And that's why early intervention is so important. If we can avoid the avoidance, Early on, we catch it at age five or six for the shy kid, or we catch it at age seven or eight for the select of the new kid, it's a lot easier to treat than when you're 16 years old. Right? The kids who struggle and take a little bit longer in anxiety treatment, or adults, or people who have had it for years, it's a lot more challenging because you've given your more, yourself more reason to be afraid because every time you avoid what happens again, you give yourself a reason to fear because you've never had that successful experience of, oh, it didn't happen. Have to hang out with me for a week. <laughs> Can you repeat that question? So everyone... Yeah. What she was asking is, if you have a shy kid or an anxious kid, what do you do if someone's really extra, an extrovert in your family and constantly trying to play, constantly trying to get them engaged, and be a fixer, that kind of stuff? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. I, I know the question because I've had it asked many, many times. And that's when exposure starts, right? We'll talk about a hierarchy here in a little bit. And we'll ask kids questions like, if someone came up to you like me, and I'm talking your ear off, and I'm up here being crazy telling you about black mambas, what's your anxiety level, one to 10? Right, we'll show them scales, we'll have happy face on their scales, things like that they can show us. And the kids still give me like, you need to quit talking, because I can't talk right now, I'm, I'm, I know I'm overwhelming them, right? So I'll have a back touch, right? It's getting them used to someone who's not as much of an extrovert at first, and then ramping it up, 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 right? If I really want to address my fear of snakes, I'd work with the zoo or the library when they have those animals come and my children hold the nasty, slimy things and I won't touch them for a week. So, I'm joking, I still touch my children, but it's not fun. Actually, I, I bet you have to wash your hands if you touch the snake because, you know, their slime will kill you too. I think it might turn into a snake, like a zombie thing, I'm not sure. But it's dangerous. Yes? Snakes are slimy. Oh, they are to me. <laughs> See? Anxiety, rational thought. Right? They're actually dry, I know. I don't, I've never touched one. I probably never will touch one. Uh, but if I really wanted to work on, a, on snakes, um, I, I, would, I would expose myself to being around snakes. If I see a snake at the end of the cage, it doesn't bother me. My fear is not extreme. But if that snake is out of that cage and it's coming at me for whatever reason, my body says, get out. Right? And I'd have to learn to sit there with it. I'd have to learn to be in, the, be in a room with the snake, running loose. A room this size would be a good place for me to start. Because I can keep away. I have plenty of room to move, right? 
you move me to a bathroom stall with a snake, I'm breaking that door down, right? I'm climbing over right now, but after time, I wouldn't. Same thing with the extrovert kid. You can start with someone who is more passive, or maybe more of an introvert to have that conversation with. It's like walking around the hallway and just waving at people. Instead of walking in the hallway and saying, I wipe with that hand. Big difference between those two behaviors, right? Doing this can make someone super anxious. That's where we need to start, that's where we start. And we work into that extrovert person, right? I'm an extrovert. I am most definitely an extrovert, uh, and it's just who I am, and, and it works really well for anxiety treatment, especially with kids who are socially anxious, because they just see me and they're just like, oh, this guy's not just crazy, this is who he is. I'm kind of crazy too, don't ask, bam, don't say anything. Uh, <laughs> uh, emphasize the anxiety treatment, identify the struggle as being anxiety, it's nothing else. Because if we don't realize that it's not, if, if we think of something else, that's when it becomes real again, right? That's when it becomes that fear versus anxiety thing. Every time we think it isn't anxiety, we think we lose. That's avoidance, that, that, that's not realizing what the problem that <coughs> is. Once you can understand what anxiety is, and realize that it's a problem with your thought process, and realize that it's a lot of irrational thinking, it becomes a lot easier to handle. Oh, you know what, that is just anxiety, right? Uh, my wife is, is an anxious person at times, just like most people, and I will literally walk her through cognitive restructuring sometimes. I don't have to anymore because she'll do it herself. Right? Just look at me, she's like, I know, and she'll walk off. <laughs> and then she'll come back and say something about a snake to harass me, so. So what is this cognitive restructuring that I've been talking about? So we want to identify situations that result in anxiety. Easy examples that socially anxious kid, right? Um, socially anxious kid, anybody have to know someone who's socially anxious? Yeah, what's a fear they have? Not being liked, right? Again, uh, what, I, what I've noticed in social anxiety in, in my time here is a lot of times, it's a fear of what others think about you, more so than being in front of other people, right? It tells you guys, I don't care what you think about me. Joking. Um, it really though, I, it, 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 it is bothering me, right? It, it just over time, some people are gonna love it, some people aren't, and that's okay, right? It, it really is just the how things are, but in a kid's mind who's going to that situation, maybe the shy kid, it could be, Johnny doesn't like me, Sally doesn't like me, my teacher doesn't like me, my uncle doesn't like me, so I'm just not gonna talk. So they can't judge me, right? That's a comfortable feeling. Um, identify thoughts that are automatic and irrational. Have anybody ever been anxious and you just have this thought come into your mind like that? Ever happened? Right, see a lot of heads nodding. Um, happened with the snake, the snake showed up and I thought my mom's gonna die, right? I don't like it, but it wasn't comfortable. Uh, sometimes we work up to it a little bit more, but a lot of times it's just this quick, automatic thought that comes into our head. Uh, someone's gonna break in the house. I had a young man I worked with who, whose parents had separated. It was a good, clean separation, but in his mind, from the friends he knew and other things he heard about when parents separate, you gotta watch your back, right? And he was in a situation where he thought it was a really dangerous situation that dad was going to come back and dad was going to break into the house and steal the kids and all this stuff. And I'm thinking like, wow, okay. So we talked about it. Dad was coming to sessions and hearing all this too. And dad was sitting here like, what? What is happening? It wasn't even a divorce. It was actually a separation. They got back together and they ended up working things out. And the kid was still super anxious. He developed this fear of the house getting broken into. And so we walked through things, exposure like he would with an extrovert. Uh, or an introvert, sorry, um, to what, what his steps were at night. So at, every night, he would literally wake up every hour, check the alarm, to lock the doors, to make sure there's a baseball bat, to make sure the dog was awake. The dog, poor dog, never slept. <laughs> poor dog didn't get sleep. And it was a big dog. You're talking German Shepherd here. It was a big, big old dog that he had. They had two of them. Um, they lived in a nice neighborhood. So we start walking through. Where do you live in the Vega? Oh, we live over here off Gates Park, the Gates area. Okay. So we're not talking Central Topeka, we're not talking Highland Park, we're not talking some of the higher crime areas. Yeah, okay. Well, what do you have in your house to protect? <coughs> well, we have locks. <coughs> cool, you have locks in your windows? Yep. Okay, so we start walking through this process. He's got locks in his windows, he's got locks in his doors, they've got an alarm system. His dad was a cop. <coughs> Come on, he's got two German Shepherds. They are very protective dogs. Um, the dad said if anybody tried to get in the house, they'd probably lick them to death, but the bark's so big that it wouldn't, it would terrify anybody <coughs> off, which is perfectly fine and reasonable. Um, a, a lot of things like that we start walking through. The kid goes, but what if they come through my window? 
well, there's a lock on your window. And you live on the second story. He goes, they're, they're going to do, I just know it. They're going to come, they're going to break the window silently. He's been watching too many Spy Kids movies. And they're going to come and ask who would want you that bad? <laughs> Parents laughed. He laughed. I thought it was fun. Uh, and he goes, well, probably nobody, but what if? And that's what anxiety does to us. That what if scenario is always up in the ante, always one more. What if that snake, what if that arm around me isn't my wife? And it's, it, it's a snake, which is why she got hit all the time. I'm so sorry. Um, how does that thought make you feel? Not good, right? It makes you uncomfortable. But for that kid, what were the odds of someone dragging the ladder to the house, banging it up against the side of the house, climbing the second story, breaking the window, carrying him down the ladder without waking somebody up? What are the odds? Probably not very good. Is it something that can happen? Sure. But again, what are the odds? Very, very, very slim, right? Again, I always like to go back to that. How long are you? How old are you? Well, I'm 12. How many times has someone broken into your house? Well, it's never happened. Okay. Right? I'm, I'm 34 years old. No one's broken into my house, unfortunately. But I bet most people in here haven't had that experience either. Maybe you have. And that's unfortunate, but you're in the minority if you are. Right? Would we agree to, we agree to that? It, it usually is something a little different. Uh, what emotions does that lead you to believe? That's when we start getting into things. So those thoughts get out of control, those emotions get out of control, those behaviors get out of control, we try and avoid, and we start spiraling absolutely out of control. So cognitive restructuring continued. Find evidence to the contrary. Help the child or adult or whoever it is to think more rationally. Is it rational for me to think that that snake is a black mom that's going to eat me? Absolutely not. Is it rational to think the snake's going to bite me? Probably not even accurate, right? It's a little gardener snake. It was literally a baby. Didn't matter. It was going to eat me. Um, that was my irrational thought. So some things you could ask someone who's anxious. These are things therapists ask all the time. How sure are you this thought's true? You've heard me ask questions like this throughout the, tr the, the night. Um, are you 100% sure that's accurate? I love that question because if they say, well, no, it gives me an end, right? How sure are you? Well, I'm 90% sure. Cool. There's a 10% chance it's not going to happen. Right? Well, that may not be realistic, or that may not be reality. It gets to starting. For a kid who's really anxious and is really 90% sure it's going to happen, at least in their mind, or an adult, or whoever it is, it gives me a starting point. Cool. So there's a 10% chance that mom's not going to get in a wreck if we flip the switches, right? Well, let's look at the statistics. How many times has mom been in a wreck? How many times have you forgot to do this? I bet you weren't doing it when you were two years old. Well, no, I didn't know then. Ah, so how has mom protected those first two years of your life? Makes sense? So we start cycling through this and proving them every piece of evidence we can find to the contrary that what they're afraid of isn't going to happen. Did you have a question? OK, sorry. What else could happen? Is this thought realistic? A lot of times, as adults, we can tell ourselves that thought's not realistic. If you think about times you've been anxious, I hope everyone can walk away today and have that thought and be like, yep, yeah, that's not realistic. And a lot of times that's enough. A lot of times we can complete treatment with just this process. Are you basing your thoughts on facts or on feelings? Right? I'm big into the facts. Let's do some research. Let's look at the numbers. Let's see how many players actually hit Topeka. Let's look at the size. Let's look at the square footage of damage is usually done. Let's figure this out. What is the evidence for the thought, and what facts support and don't support this thought? So with that kid, who was probably 10, 11 years old at the time, that had OCD, and he had to hit things three times, what evidence did he have that mom's going to get in the car and die if he didn't do it? None. Well, until she got the wreck out front, right? But even then, while that was a disastrous day of a session, for the kid, for the therapist, I was more, I thought I, I ruined the child. I was like, oh my gosh, what is going on? He came back in, we talked about it. He had done enough work with us beforehand to realize it wasn't rational. The odds of that happening were so, so small. And it took about two weeks before he was willing to do it again. But he came and he did it again. 
And what we did was we kept mom in the lobby. Mom didn't go anywhere. Mom just stayed there. So he could be with mom just in case it happened. He'd be there to take care of her. Right? He threw a curveball at us. Life threw a curveball at us. So we threw a curveball back and said, okay, plan B. And that's a lot of anxiety treatment. There's a lot of plan Bs and plan Cs and plan Ds because sometimes we do something and the kid goes, oh my goodness, I just realized that makes me anxious. Or we see it. Or we just feel it. Sometimes you're around somebody who just feel that anxiety we've done it for so long. We have some cool tools. Uh, we have a thing kind of like this that we hook onto someone's ear and it will take your blood pump. It will take your heart rate as you're, as you're walking through, put it on their finger. And so kids who like to lie to us just so they can get down with treatment, we like to put that on their finger and we can see their heart rate spike. Walking around shaking hands, you're sitting at a 130, 140 heart rate just shaking hands. Probably tells me you're a little more anxious than what you're telling me. You're telling me you're a two, but I go put this hard drive in and all of a sudden I see that your like, heart rate's 150. I'm guessing you're, you're, you're probably, probably pushing a little too hard. Maybe we just step it back a bit, right? We have some sneaky ways to do things like that too. A lot of times we like to make it into a game. It's fun for kids to play a game. Hit a balloon, name my stuffed animal, what's your favorite superhero? If you could have any superpower, what would it be? Make it into a project for them. For those shy kids, it's really a fun thing to do for them. Find their interests and use it. So this is what I was talking about with that step chart. The situation, the thoughts, the emotions, and the behaviors. What we do with this chart is we give it to families, we give it to kids, and I almost always ask the clients I work with to come up with one situation that made them anxious over the next week. Most of them do more than one. And I want you to write what the situation was. I want you to tell me what the thoughts were in the situation, how that made you feel, and what you did as a result. Anybody want to give me an example? I'll, I'll make something up out of it. Anyone want to give me an example of an anxious, anxious situation that's happened to them or someone they know or just something that just sounds like would make someone anxious? Being late for work. Being late for work. All right. So you think you're going to be late for work? Or you are late for work? No. I <laughs> just sometimes. Fair enough. Fair enough. I wouldn't talk to you about you personally, but now no. Uh, <laughs> Um, I mean, being late for work is a little bit tricky because that can legitimately be a fear thing too. Because if you are late for work, there can be consequences for that. Um, so let's just use social anxiety. Sound fair? <clears throat> Again, it's just an easy example to use. We all know someone who's been socially anxious. We've all probably been socially anxious at some point. Um, so the situation is you're giving a speech in front of class. We use that example many times a day. We'll just go there, right? You're giving a speech in front of the class. The thought is, what, what, what's the thought someone have in the situation? Anyone want to throw something out there that someone might have or you might have in that situation when you have to give a speech? If you're up here instead of me, what are you thinking? Forget what I'm supposed to say. Right, I'm going to forget what I'm supposed to say. Right? I had a presentation I gave at a national conference and it was terrifying. I had been a clinician for two years and we were presenting on selectively mute kids because we had a successful treatment of one and there's really not a lot of protocols on it. And I, I was mortified. I was doing it with our anxiety director, Dr. Callis, at the time. And it was, it was terrifying. And she goes, I have never seen you nervous. And I said, I know! And then she made fun of me. She's like, there's not even a snake. And I was like, yes, Abby, thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> Trying to loosen me up. And, and, and my thoughts were, we have the who's who people come to talk to me. I've done this for two years. The professors that taught me are coming. Like, this is, this is nuts. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know the answers to the questions they're going to ask me. I don't know. We, we've done this with one kid. We've had one kid, we're trying to make a treatment protocol with one client. It's, it's, that's, that's intimidating, right? Abby's jazz. She is stoked. She is ready to go. I mean, I start making her nervous. <laughs> Oops. Uh, so, so we get there, and I have to start saying to myself the night before, I start saying to myself, you know what? If they ask me questions I don't know, that's good. Because it gives us another start. Right? If I don't know the answer, that's okay. Because it makes me have to go back to the drawing board and research. It makes me have to go back and figure out what we did to make it work. If they ask me questions I do know, that's great too. But I, was kind of, I got to the point where I was excited about getting asked questions I didn't know because it was a new style of treatment. It was a new protocol that we were developing. And it was, it was really fun to do to hear from people who wrote the books that we learned from giving us feedback on things. While still somewhat intimidating, I became a lot more confident with it because you know what? I, I, I've given this training 30, 40 times to schools, to the police department, to parents, in session, I mean, many times we count in session, right? This becomes where I know what the next slide is going to be. I've done it so often, you just get to know what's coming up next. Um, so I, I, I said, you know, we, we developed this, so if it's wrong, it's 
it's wrong, but it worked. We had a successful case. We know it was successful with this kid, so at least we know that. This was us just saying, this is what worked. This is our case study. This is our case example. What do you guys have that we can build off of this? And we did. We got so much good information from it. Uh, but again, those thoughts that I had were, were debilitating. It was, I was going to be able to speak. They were going to ask me questions I didn't know the answers to. I had to come back that bag with rational thoughts that it's okay to not know the answer, right? It stinks, but it's okay, especially with something new like this. How did I feel emotionally? If I'm thinking that I don't know what to do, I'm not going to be able to answer the questions, I'm not prepared, what's my emotional state? Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, everything. I was angry. I was mad. I was frustrated. I was sad. I was anxious. Everything just starts coming out. I was like, I don't know how to handle this now. I'm frustrated. Like, what I'm going to do? Behaviors? I just wanted to not do it. I started getting cold, right? I started coughing a little bit. I started getting a tickle in my throat. I started thinking, like, what can I do to get out of this? Again, how did I combat that? I go back to thinking rationally. How much time did I put others? presentation, probably 100 hours, not this one, but that one, right? How many hours did I spend working with this client to be successful? Hours, right? How many hours have I studied anxiety? How many hours did I go to school? How many times did I practice this presentation on groups with our anxiety treatment program to train our interns? Multiple, multiple times. It's already giving me more confidence, right? I feel a little bit better that way. So my emotions in that situation, I'm feeling more confident. It's not I'm perfectly fine. I'm not going up there with no anxiety. I'm still anxious, but I have a lot less anxiety, so I can go up there and I can handle it. I don't avoid it, so the anxiety goes away. Has anybody ever done acting, been on a stage, or anything like that? Several people raising their hands. That first line you give hurts sometimes, doesn't it? Or that first word you sing. I used to sing in my nerdy days in a barbershop quartet. I love singing. We competed in college. It was a lot of fun. And I remember walking out there on stage for the first time. I was like, I'm not anxious. I get this. And then I see the, the whole arena is still the people. And I go, oh, crap. I'm anxious. I don't get this. Right? And then after I sang the first couple notes, that was good. Right? For someone who's really anxious, they're going to get to the first song and they need to be good. For someone who's done it 100 times, which I have now, doesn't matter. I go out there and I'm just me. It just becomes part of me. The first time I gave this training, I was a lot more anxious than I am this time. And here's an example. Um, again, I have to teach everyone in front of class. I'm not prepared. Everyone will laugh at me. I will fail. Common thoughts someone has in a social anxiety situation. Um, again, look at that. Everyone will laugh at me, please, right? I thought I wasn't prepared. I was. I spent hours getting ready. I spent a lot of time practicing for this um, and getting there. So um, what happens? Anxious, depressed, and avoidance, and they refuse to complete the speech and consequently fail. Any of you ever had that happen to you? You failed something in class because you just couldn't do it because you were too anxious? Or had a child of yours fail because they just couldn't do it because they were too anxious? Right? In those situations, we like to ask, where do you want to start? Do you want to start doing it with just with me? Will the school allow us to do it with you and just the teacher? <coughs> and then we'll add another teacher. Then we'll add another teacher. Then we'll add me. Then we'll add mom and dad. Then we'll add a couple of students. Right? We start small. We make it harder to go. Um, again, we just restructure those thoughts like we had before. So some things we like to do with the children, especially younger kids, we like to talk about anxiety as a bully. Um, anxiety really is a bully inside your head. It tells you things that aren't real. What's a bully do to you? They're doing things to bother you, to get under your skin, to, to make you uncomfortable, to make you not feel good about yourself. That's exactly what anxiety does. It's just you doing it internally to yourself. So we teach kids that we're going to boss it back. We're going to squash the anxiety. We're going to tell you, you can't control me. I'm in control, not the anxiety. The kid who named his anxiety Mr. Freaks, I loved it because it made it so tangible for him, made it so real for him. Um, he, he knew exactly where he felt his anxiety every time. Uh, he, he would feel it in his hands more than anything because his hands would just shake. Now granted, I know he felt it in his stomach because I could see him doubling over when he got anxious. But to him, it was his hands and he was a shake. I mean, his hands would just go. Um, but again, he overcame it. A lot of it was overcome not just by exposures, but by that thought process. 
So the way we start, we start with the thought process, we'll start with kind of the cognitive restructuring piece <coughs> and give them ammo to go out there and be more successful in an exposure. Sometimes this cognitive restructuring is enough. For someone who is really intellectual, not saying you're super smart, but someone who can process things in a different way than most, sometimes this is enough. It's not intelligence-based, it's just based on how you kind of view the world and how you function in general. Um, someone who does more processing type stuff and sits back and thinks and is more intuitive about things is going to be a lot more successful with this than somebody else. Um, if they're not successful with it, that's okay. That's what exposure is for, right? That's that next step, that's that next level. Uh, help them identify what the intrusive thoughts are. Sometimes it's images. We have some PTSD stuff we use for kids who have had PTSD or maybe had a fear of flying or had a fear of wars um, because they've come from a foreign country or something like that. It's legitimate, we have those kids. We've got virtual reality stuff we use with these kids. It's really cool, it's really fun. We can throw them in those situations where they can be in the moment where there's soldiers around them again. To where they're in a thunderstorm, there's a tornado sound going off. To where they're in a plane and they're sitting next to the person next to them and they're coughing up a lung and they're like, oh my gosh, they've got the coronavirus. It's not gonna be okay, right? We, we, we can simulate that. It's hard for me to go get on a plane with a kid, right? So sometimes we have to improvise with things. Uh, relaxation techniques, another good thing to do is just practice relaxing. When you're anxious, what happens to your body? You ramp up, right? You're going 180 miles an hour, your brain's going 100 miles an hour, you're out of control, your heart rate's up, everything's going wild, so if you can start to relax yourself, find a way just to de-escalate a little bit, and we teach a lot of relaxation techniques, from deep breathing, from different ages of kids, and we'll do progressive muscle relaxation, we'll do mindfulness training, uh, mindfulness is really kind of the direction to go anymore. A lot of people use mindfulness training. If you, has anyone ever heard of mindfulness? When you first start, isn't it really hard? Man, I have so much ADHD. There's so much going on here constantly that I sit down and try to be mindful. I can't do it. And I honestly have a hard time walking kids through mindfulness activities because I struggle doing it, right? And something we always encourage our therapists, if you struggle doing it, it's probably not the right fit for you, right? I have a little girl I work with, and I see her probably every two or three months now, and she was terrified of getting her blood drawn. Uh, and she needed it to be done because she was hyperglycemic, um, she was pre-diabetic, very athletic, very fit little girl, just had genetics that just were built against her for medical disorders. And so she had all kinds of stuff. They were trying to figure out if she had celiac disease, they didn't know or not, but she couldn't get her blood drawn because she would literally run screaming from getting her blood drawn. Um, she actually, within the last six months, just got her blood drawn for all this and got it all taken care of and successful in it. I went with her. Um, that was what she asked. I said, what can I do to have you use these skills that you've been practicing? Because you are doing so well, not calling mom every five minutes from school. Not calling mom the moment you get home and when she doesn't answer, you freak out. Not calling dad and freaking out. When mom makes a sound downstairs and cough, you don't run to check on her. It was more than just the blood draw, obviously. So we sat all these successes we could throw at her and this was the last hurdle. And she goes, Travis, I cannot not avoid this. I have to avoid this. Will you come with me? And I'm sitting here like, where's that? She goes, Kansas City. And I was like, oh, you got it. Absolutely. There was really no hesitation. I asked permission from my boss. My boss said, absolutely, let's do this. I drive down there, take half a day to drive out to Kansas City with her. It took an hour because they had multiple blood draws. She brought her dog with her, who was just her support animal. We, we set this up beforehand. It's not a support animal technically, but we set it up with people we know at Children's Mercy because we work with Children's Mercy a lot. Um, so they said, yes, absolutely, as the dog had his shots. We sent information ahead of time. We got there. She knew who the nurse was because the nurses tried 15 times to draw her blood. And we finally got there, and the nurse missed. <laughs> Worst nightmare, right? So we're doing mindfulness. She pulls up an app on her phone. I didn't even know she was using this app. I suggested to her a long time ago, and she starts using this app, and you see her just immediately just go, and she became an expert at mindfulness. Like to the point where I would bring her in to train with me. To the point where I would bring her in so she could train people how to do mindfulness for me, because I struggle with it. She does an incredible job. She does 15 minutes every morning. That's how she starts every morning of her day. Whether she's anxious or not, she starts her day with 15 minutes of mindfulness and ends her day with 15 minutes of mindfulness training. Her parents start doing it with her. Kind of cool, right? Again, she had the blood draw. We went above and beyond. We got it taken care of. We asked techniques. Hope you get that extra little thing that gets us there. 
Other things we can do is worry time. Have you ever sat down and tried to just worry? This sounds silly, doesn't it? Try and be anxious for 30 minutes. I've had many kids come to my office and tell me, I'm just anxious all the time, I can't stop worrying. Cool, sit down, here's your journal. You got 30 minutes, start writing. Write down everything you worry. And after about five minutes, they stop writing. Well, maybe I exaggerated a little bit, Mr. Travis. Yeah, maybe you did. So you can't sit for an hour, you're not worrying all the time, right? So again, that's my end, that's my leverage, that's my first step there. Make sense? That's my point to say, that's your anxiety even telling you that you're worrying constantly because you're not. What are you thinking about now? What's for dinner? <laughs> Me too. Me too. I'm always worrying what's for dinner though. <laughs> so talk about anxiety. Be open and honest about it. Just like anything, just like you would talk to your children about sex and drugs and alcohol and suicide or whatever it is, have that conversation about mental health. Have that conversation about anxiety because you make it real. You label the anxiety. They know what it is, so it doesn't become as fearful. The monster hiding in the closet is terrifying until you realize it's a coat. Make sense? Awesome. <clears throat> Tolerating uncertainty. Sometimes, could, this, could that Twitter come hit your house? Maybe. We want you to know that's a possibility. The odds are very low, right? Sometimes what we do with the kids who are so anxious, we'll say, They'll ask us questions to, to be reassured. Well, well Travis, what if, what, if, what if mom gets in the car like a, a week from now? Is that still my fault? Maybe. I don't know. Right? And you're like, oh man, that is mean. But it works. Right? I hate it. It doesn't feel comfortable. It feels mean. We had a kid coming through our anxiety program, and I was one of the female therapists. I still am. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was so hard. I had to be the mean gym teacher. I'm not a mean guy. Like, that is not me. I am the outgoing goofball. And I'm sitting here like trying to scream it. I was like, no, I can't do this. This is not. So we got our COO. <laughs> Those of you who know who our COO is, he is a sergeant, and he was a sergeant in the Air Force. He was really good at it. I was not good at it. He, he was, he went drill sergeant mode and went off, and he, he's, he's not a clinician anymore. He still has his license. He still does that kind of stuff, but he hasn't done therapy in years. He jumped right in and helped us out with it. That's the cool thing about coming here is we have so many people willing to pitch in from our CEO to our COO to attendant care providers to, to marketing staff. We've had everybody pitch in on things like this. We had marketing help with a kid one time who had fear of performing. And so marketing had her help do some performance things and things like that. And she was a beautiful singer, a wonderful, wonderful singer. She had some opening stuff for us too, I believe, at one point. So uh, visualize it. We can visualize it. If we're really struggling with the anxiety, we'll start with Visualizing it, close your eye, we'll do some mindfulness. We'll, we'll practice that situation where you're doing the speech in front of people. When you do sports psychology type stuff, you do a lot of visualization. So you see athletes, what's the, what's the athlete do when they're taking a free throw? Right, every time they're practicing. They're practicing five times, they're, that's what they're doing. They're visualizing it going in. They're visualizing it they missing, they're getting the missing the point, right? But visualize it. That way you can get used to the situation. That might be enough to make someone a 10 on that one to 10 anxiety scale. And that might be where we start, which is visualization. Um, activity scheduling, this is really just scheduling out your day. Uh, sometimes people who have to do this is really helpful in the sense of you're going to have 30 minutes here where you're just going to sit and worry. This 30 minutes, we're going to move on. 30 minutes to worry, 30 minutes to worry. It's really difficult, but it's, it's, it's a lot more complex to do. One of those things you can probably get from like guidance on, um, from someone who's done Not that it's really, you can't do it, just people have done it more often. So teaching new skills, again, when we're teaching new skills, we want to practice, praise, point out, and prompt. So important to, again, identify these issues as what they are, which is anxiety. If they think it's legitimate fear, if a kid has the fear that you or I would have of someone holding a gun to our head for giving a speech, that's out of the norm, right? But I guarantee you, we have youth in the community who have that, because I've seen it many, many times. They need to know, number one, that it is anxiety. They need to practice the anxiety. They need to practice not being anxious. They need to practice being anxious. They need to phrase point out the problem. Anxiety is a good thing sometimes. If you have a student who isn't anxious about a test at all, how do they do typically? Not very well, because they're not studying. They're not focusing. If you have a student who's super anxious and studying constantly, how do they do? Not very well, because they're not sleeping. They're not getting a chance to rest and let the information soak in. If you have that middle brown, you tend to do pretty well. Some of the most important things you can do, prevent undoing means 
we're not allowing them to avoid, right? Prevent undoing the hand washer, the kid who's washing his hands, or the kid who jumps twice and then sits down and does a sneaky third jump, right? I learned my lesson. When it's kids like that, always make them do one more, right? Don't, don't do two, because you can undo that really fast. So I made him do a fourth. And to him, it wasn't a matter of doing two more. It was set that that was four, and I can't go backward now. I could do six, and I asked him. He goes, well, I could do six, but that's six, not three. That's a lot more fun and a lot easier. And most OCD people who have number type issues, you're going to see that. Um, it really is stuck at whatever number it is. If it's seven, if it's three, if it's four, or whatever it is, you'll see that. I don't know why that happens. It's not important. Where the anxiety comes from usually isn't important. Uh, it's just a matter of treating. Active ignoring, sometimes you want to ignore the anxious behaviors. Um, sometimes it can become attention seeking. Sometimes it can become reassurance um, if we're giving them so much attention and we're helping them avoid by not ignoring something. All right, so lastly, I'm going to wrap things up just in a few minutes here. This is kind of a hierarchy we were talking about. So this would be an, a hierarchy of someone who is, has social anxiety. So we asked them, 1 to 10, what are some things that would make you anxious? So a 10 for this person is doing something dumb while other people watch, asking someone to leave me alone, things like that. You can see how going into a crowd makes this person a 5 already, right? Some people going into a crowd is going to be a 10. So we'll start with going into an area with two people, right? OK, now let's do 4. Make sense? What we'll do is we'll start those fives and six typically. We don't want to start any higher than that. If we start higher than that, what starts to happen is the kid doesn't trust us and we lose that trust. We have a lot of kids come in and everything's a seven or an eight or a nine or a 10, right? Which is why we ask some of these more difficult questions first. What would it be like going in front of a crowd of 50 people giving a speech? Oh my gosh, that's a 10. What about 100 people? Oh, well. What if they're all adults? What if they're kids? What if they're all boys? What if they're all girls? <laughs> what if it's just one person and it's the person you have a crush on? Right? That gets our team sweating real fast. Ask a person for something. Say hi to someone in the hallway. You see, when you start with these, and what happens is these eight, nines, and tens becomes four, five, and sixes, too. Because they start to habituate. They start to realize that that fear, they start to have those successful moments of, I was sick and I didn't get cancer. They start to have that illness, uh, that, that situation of I talked to someone and I, and I wasn't shy, right? No one made fun of me today. That was, that was a great day. So active responses, we can list thoughts, humor the thought, don't act on it, sing a song of worry, write new stories about bad events, and again, we can go back to that worry time, just having that. Again, these are things we do for some of the younger kids, uh, but it really is helpful. Um, humor works really well. Humor is, is something I love to use when I do therapy, just in general for a depressed kid, for an angry kid, whatever it is, because it just lightens the mood. Laughing is so important. Getting out. Physical activity is so important with anxiety. With anything in mental health, physical activity is so important to get out there. You'll see changes almost immediately. And these are just some resources. Um, you guys have the, the printouts of these as well. These are resources we use in our clinic frequently. Um, we have more. If you guys are wanting more resources or wanting more information, come grab me afterward. Any questions before we wrap it up as a group? All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Hopefully we make it out to our other nights. These are so exciting for us. We love being able to do it. We love preventative stuff. We're just educating people. So thank you so much.